Hello, everyone. This is Seraphim Hamilton. And today I have a very exciting beginning of a multi part series engaging with the arguments of Gavin Ortland about the biblical and historical basis for the veneration of images. Before we get into this subject, I just want to mention I have a book, a compilation of essays I've written over a number of years, which you can buy on Amazon at the uh, pinned comment below called Christ in All Things, Essays on Scripture and Theology. And if you're interested in pursuing a biblical critique of Protestantism, Protestantism further, I also have a 17-hour course on the subject, which you can purchase again at the link in the pinned comment below. When you purchase that course, I will then send you an email with the Dropbox uh, with all of the lectures, which again come to about 17 hours. So I'm here with uh, Michael Garten, who is an Orthodox uh, educator. Uh, he uh, did a bachelor's degree in classics in Biola University. Uh, he also did graduate work in philosophy at Northern Illinois University. Uh, he's helped with founding two Orthodox schools, uh, has been a Sunday school teacher for many years, and is writing a very exciting book on icon veneration in the pre-Nicene church, which is expected to be published this summer. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Seraphim. Um... This has been a long time coming. I'm I'm glad we're able to team up like this. And uh, it's really cool being able to, to work alongside you, given that, I mean, I think a lot of our interests uh, coincide. And I think we have pretty similar takes on things yeah. most of the time as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy about this team up. And, and I hope this video will be, um, I hope that this will be edifying for those who listen. Yeah. And that we'll be able to uh, provide all of our listeners with some really important uh, insights about uh, early Christianity and the truth about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, Gavin Ortland's uh, videos on this subject have caused, to say the least, uh, quite a stir. Uh, they have come cumulatively close to 100,000 views. Uh, they have spurred a lot of discussion and debate among Catholics, uh, Orthodox uh, and Protestants. And I know that uh, for many people who have not really encountered these issues before, uh, many people have been uh, troubled uh, by a lot of the arguments that he made. And it should be said that, you know, Dr. Ortland is a smart guy. Uh, he seems to be a person of genuine uh, Christian character. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, at least, I really uh, appreciate um, the level of depth with which he attempts to engage this issue. And it's an important challenge for us to really engage on its own terms and not be dismissive of. Um, I hope one of the things that's going to come out in this series of videos um, is that these challenges really can be engaged on their own terms. And uh, Michael, in particular, is going to be bringing out a lot of evidence about the early Christian veneration of icons, which really, at least in the context of this discussion, um, is not very widely known. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so just a note for the viewing audience, this is the first in a series of videos. Uh, we're gonna cover both uh, the biblical and then from a kind of bird's eye view, the historical uh, uh, arguments on the matter. Uh, then there's going to be a break. Uh, I have my wedding and honeymoon uh, next month. And then in July, we're going to come back to this and do uh, several more videos. I think it's just as many as it takes for us uh, to get through the issues in the amount of depth that they really uh, demand. Um, so is there anything you wanted to say or add uh, before I get into the biblical side of the question? Uh, I will add, um, I will add two things. And uh, the first is that I do want to emphasize the fact that um, we acknowledge that with the critique that Gavin Orland is making, uh, that it constitutes an attempt at an internal critique of orthodoxy and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's attempting to take orthodox and Catholic uh, teachings and show that there's like a contradiction between them, and specifically that the contradiction amounts to um, uh, claiming to be um, the authentic inheritors of the faith and practice of the New Testament church and the pre-Nicene church, while also uh, believing in the permissibility and necessity even of venerating images. Yeah. And this, um, Dr. Orland's claim is that those things are in conflict because the New Testament does not permit icon veneration, mm -hmm. um, or at least would like warn gravely against it uh, and certainly not make it mandatory or something. Uh, and that he also, um, in, in his view, uh, sees the pre-Nicene church as reflecting that same stance of not permitting icon veneration. 
Yeah. Um, uh, and so noting that it's an internal critique at the outset, I think is important because um, we're not interested in, for instance, uh, just getting into kind of two quoque responses such as, well, you know, you, d you know, uh, how do you justify the canon? Wasn't right. that Grecian in a certain sense, so on and so forth. Right. Um, right. So that's one thing. Uh, I also want to credit various people uh, briefly. So um, uh, some of the uh, some of the people who have influenced my perspective on this. First of all, Father Stephen Bigham, um, whose book I read over a decade ago, and who kind of reoriented my my search for uh, my research about this. I, I found his book extremely helpful as like a a touch off point. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the videos put out by people such as Craig Truglia, uh, William Albrecht, uh, Jim Papandrea, uh, David Erhan, and um, I know that there are a few others out there, but uh, uh, some of the material that I present will be um, uh, a development of uh, what they included in their presentations and in their uh, online articles, but there's going to be a lot in here that has, has not been covered before, um, and some of what I'm going to try to do will be an attempt to reverse um, the interpretation of certain uh, pre-Nicene figures as uh, iconophobic and to show that they venerated icons. And that is, I think, a, a new move. Um, the number and kind of sources of evidence will be uh, will be different in this video. Um, there have been a couple of attempts to, to push back against the claim that there's a kind of consensus among pre-Nicene authors. Um, but this is going to be a much more decisive attempt to show um, numerous clear cases of icon veneration pre-325 AD. Um, yeah, and then um, and then one third clarification. Uh, in future videos, uh, Seraphim and I would want to handle uh, certain kinds of objections uh, that Dr. Orland put forward. Um, for instance, attempts to show that um, various pre-Nicene authors were iconophobic or... Um, opposed and spoke explicitly against Iconodulia. Uh, that's something that would be part of those more like deep dive videos, I guess. Um, although that will be partially taken care of, of course, by just showing icon veneration by some of those authors. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point about um, kind of the nature of the argument that he makes. Um, because I think we really do have to recognize that kind of appealing to magisterial fiat is not going to work here. And I think one of the reasons for that, and I think we'll get into this a little bit when we get to your part of the presentation, one of the reasons for that is that um, to Nicaea, at least according to what I think is a pretty plain reading of it, um, is making an historical argument. Um, it's not making an argument based on kind of a very kind of abstract notion of doctrinal development. It is not saying that it is reversing the explicit teaching of earlier fathers, but somehow teasing out the implications of their teaching, which are contradicted by their explicit teaching, which I yes, don't really think right. is a coherent idea. Yeah. Tunisia is making a very kind of straightforward historical argument. And I think as Orthodox and as Catholics, we have to wrestle with the fact that the council not only um, affirms the necessity of venerating icons, but also it affirms it on a very particular set of grounds. And I think those grounds are just as important as the teaching which it presents to us. So if we want to defend the legacy of Second Nicaea, as I think all Catholics and Orthodox ought to want to do, then we need to grapple with that. So um, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited for our discussion today, um, because I think there is, to some degree, um, a little bit of a gap in the market in the Catholic and Orthodox uh, response to Dr. Orland's work that uh, hopefully we'll be uh, filling in. And and um, one additional clarification about that. Um, I do think that there is a distinction between saying that the council um, reflected the mind of the early church uh, and reflected the apostolic mindset and apostolic and sub-apostolic practices. I do think there's a difference between making that claim and saying that scholarship can explicitly verify that in all of its details. But that being said, um, there is quite quite an abundance of evidence um, pre-325 AD that we'll take a look at today. Yeah. So if you're if you're Protestant uh, or if you're, you know, from any perspective, you're coming at this and you're kind of just expecting uh, well, there are cherubim in the temple and uh, Dura Europos, and that's it. Well, prepare to be surprised because there is a great deal more material that we're going to be covering both in this video and in uh, the videos to come. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, 
Can I get into the biblical side of it now? Or is there anything else? Yeah. Okay, great. So let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. So um, what I'm going to be covering is the biblical side of this argument. So if you're watching this video or if you're listening to this video and you're waiting for me to draw a connection between what I take to be the biblical theology of hearing and seeing or the biblical theology of iconography and the practice of the Antonician church, you really have to wait for Michael's part of the presentation. That's not my area of, uh, of specialty. It's not what I intend to be dealing with. What I want to deal with is just the logic of biblical theology on its own terms. And in addressing that logic, we need to start, of course, with the second word or the second commandment, which forbids the making and the reverence towards images. So we want to look at what the second word says and why it says it. So in order to get at this question, we first have to ask, what exactly are the 10 words? And so that, that's what the Bible consistently calls them, the 10 words. We're used to calling them the 10 commandments. Uh, more literally, as I understand it, uh, they are the 10 words. Or words. And what happens when Moses goes to Mount Sinai is he goes up into the glory cloud and what he sees is the divine blueprint for creation. So viewers on this channel are very familiar with the idea that the tabernacle and the temple are a microcosmic representation of the architecture of creation writ large. So creation writ large is the heaven of heavens. It's where God dwells, the visible celestial heavens where the stars are, uh, and then the earth. And that is replicated in terms of the holy of holies, the holy place, and then the courtyard with the bronze altar, so on and so forth. And in the seven speeches of Exodus chapters 25 to 31, we have seven uh, sections which correspond in some cases quite directly and obviously with the seven creation days. So this is part of establishing that this is indeed an architectural representation of the creation. So for example, uh, these seven speeches are very easily divisible because they each begin with the words the Lord said to Moses. The seventh of those speeches deals with the Sabbath. The sixth of those speeches uh, deals with Bezalel, who is filled with the Spirit of God, and he is enabled with the power to create and mold the world, which is what happens. Adam is filled with the breath of life or the Spirit of God and is able to do the same thing, and so on and so forth. And you can make various kinds of connections between the creation days uh, and the uh, architecture of the tabernacle. And the underlying theology here is that earth is an imprint uh, of the life of heaven. Earth is a copy of things which pre-exist in the mind of God. So Genesis 1 begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then it is the earth, which is without form, void, and dark. And then throughout the six creation days, what happens is God is going to form, fill, and brighten the world so that it grows closer to the archetype, which is its heavenly model. So in the construction of the tabernacle and in the whole pattern of the Sinaitic revelation, what you have is you have the life of heaven, the life of God coming and being imprinted and joined to uh, the life in uh, this material cosmos. Uh, and the 10 words are the first representation of that. Uh, in Genesis 1, there are seven days Days, but God actually speaks uh, precisely uh, 10 times. And uh, James Jordan and other commentators have made the argument that if you tease out the underlying theology of each of the Ten Commandments, you can actually find correspondences between each of the commandments and the Ten Creative Words, which collectively form the divine blueprint or word or logos for the creation as a whole. But what's really important to understand here and what's really important to understand about the theology of the Old Testament in general is that the way in which the divine word is made manifest to Israel is preeminently through hearing. The ten words are heard and not seen. And this is something that you see developed in a number of passages throughout the law and the prophets. So when God makes himself known to Israel, he is usually concealed within a deep darkness. You have to enter into that deep darkness if you're going to have the vision of the divine light. When Moses has a vision of the divine light and he comes down the mountain, Israel cannot withstand it. And so Moses has to veil his face, just as when God fills the, uh, the tabernacle with his glory and he dwells in the Holy of Holies, there has to be a veil placed over the Holy of holies uh, because Israel cannot withstand the visible manifestation of 
of God's presence. And so within this context, we have to ask the question, what are the 10 words? Are they a permanent statute for all mankind, or are they Torah instruction that is delivered specifically as part of the Sinaitic revelation? So I think at least implicitly, uh, we are often accustomed to thinking of the Ten Commandments as this kind of universal law, which is delivered to all mankind, Israel and the nations alike, and which is kind of detached from any particular stage in covenant history. But I think it's very clear when you actually look at the commandments themselves that that is not the case. So one of the most obvious examples of that, if you you know hold a normative Christian view on the Sabbath, um, is the fourth word. Uh, the fourth word commands Israel to keep the seventh day Sabbath, and it commands them to keep the seventh day Sabbath in a very specific way. We would say that that is not something which is binding in the literal sense on Christians under the new covenant. So the fact that that is the case of at least one of these commandments at least opens the possibility that that is the case with something like the second word. So many Protestants will, in looking at the second commandment, say this is so clear, how can you try to get around this? How can you get around the force of it? Well, it is incredibly clear, but it is no more or less clear than is the commandment to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath in the specific way that the Torah prescribes you observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. The question fundamentally is what the basis of these commandments is and whether that is related to something which is particular to this stage in covenant history prior to the incarnation of the word and the arrival of the new covenant. And that is the fundamental argument that I'm going to be making, that if you look at the way the Bible uses these texts, if you look at the reasoning that the Bible uses for grounding the second commandment, and if you look at the way the New Testament not only draws thematically on this, but actually alludes to these these specific texts, then you find that the second word is not something which applies to us directly in the way that Dr. Ortland's position would require it to apply. Though even there, I'm going to argue that Dr. Ortland himself and most Protestants don't actually apply the second word um, as directly as they claim to do. So let's look at the two um, versions of the second uh, word that we find in the Torah. One of them is in Exodus chapter 20. The other is in Deuteronomy chapter 4. So Exodus chapter 20 says this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So I'm going to return to this in a little bit, but I just want you to note that there is no category here for an image which you can make in a religious sense but cannot honor. The commandment not to make images is given in the very same language and with the very same force that the commandment not to honor or revere these images is given. You shall not make, you shall not honor. The basis for both of these commandments is the same and they really have to be taken as a unit. Now, Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 12 to 18. Then, the, and this is Moses speaking. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice and he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the 10 commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. So the basis for the prohibition on making images is very specific. And that basis is that Israel, when they made covenant with God at Sinai, or more precisely, when God made covenant with them at Sinai, they did not behold God in visible form. Rather, the mode in which God disclosed himself to Israel was through the spoken word. They heard only a voice. And because that is the way in which God made himself known to the children of Israel, that is the way in which they are 
to honor him. And so this connects with what I was saying earlier about the 10 words being the enduring form of the divine presence in Israel. And this is something that you hear much more than it is something that you see. Now, I want to set down a note here and point out that this is not actually the same thing as saying God has no form. So this is a, a really delicate issue which needs to be navigated very carefully. I've discussed this in a video on, uh, on, on the question of whether we can speak of God having a body or not. Um, uh, but the the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, actually speak a number of times of the form of the Lord. And what is being said to Israel here is, you saw no form. Israel saw no form. And therefore, because they did not see God in visible form, there is no legitimate paradigm by which they might symbolically replicate God in visible form. Rather, the way in which God condescended to them was by giving them the structure of the tabernacle, by giving them the 10 words, and they are to worship God after the mode in which he has disclosed himself. So when we look at iconography, I think if we're Speaking in terms of biblical theology, we want to speak of this in terms of the narrative arc of covenant history. So St. John of Damascus, he makes a very specific argument about the legitimacy of iconography. And I think among Catholics and Orthodox, there can sometimes be a, um, a kind of skirting around uh, of this argument or a kind of reduction of the argument to basically the fact that there were, in some sense, images in the tabernacle and the temple. Now, I don't want to set those images aside as if they're irrelevant, because I don't think they're irrelevant. But I think we want to note that John of Damascus is not making the argument that, well, images were always okay, full stop, because in fact, there were images in the tabernacle in the temple. Uh, therefore, the commandment not to make images doesn't really apply to us because we've always been making images. Rather, John of Damascus says that Israel under the old covenant was prohibited by uh, from making a, a visible representation of God precisely because God had not made known his form to the children of Israel. But in the incarnation of the word, the form of God, that is the um, God's self-knowledge, his logos of himself, which is also the logos of creation, that form has joined itself to the corporeal, terrestrial stuff of our world so that he has made known himself to us visibly. And because he has made himself known to us visibly, we respond to that in turn by worshiping God including the visible aspect of that self-disclosure. That is, you saw no form under the old covenant. Because you saw no form, you are to make no form. But under the new covenant, we have, in fact, seen a form in the form of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. And if that is the case, then the logic of the biblical um, a prohibition actually suggests that we should be making images or icons of Christ because that aspect of um, our experience of the world, that visible um, sight of God, is now an integral part of how God has revealed himself uh, to man. And so I think we can connect this argument to um, a broader biblical theme about the nature of idolatry. So what is idolatry? All idolatry is fundamentally self-worship. And because we do not have self-existence, to turn inwards and to worship ourselves leads invariably to disintegration because we are always receiving life from the outside. So to turn one's face away from that outside, as it were, and look inwards as the ultimate principle or source of our being means that our being is going to disintegrate. So that is what Paul develops in Romans chapter one. He says that uh, the nations exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that resemble mortal man and birds and beasts. You become like that which you worship, and when you worship things which are mortal, which do not have life in themselves, you yourself are going to become mortal. And that's what we see happening throughout the Bible. Uh, you have the tree of life, and you have the tree of knowledge. Well, the knowledge of good and evil, if you just look at the use of that phrase throughout the Bible, the knowledge of good and evil refers to your capacity to exercise sovereignty and dominion in relation to the creation. So Solomon prays for the wisdom to discern between good and evil. He's praying for the wisdom to act as king. Uh, the tree of life, well, the nearest kind of textual referent for that goes back to 
uh, when God put the spirit or breath of life into Adam. The tree of life signifies the act of receiving life from the outside from God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil signifies the capacity to render judgments on creation and exercise sovereignty over it, which again depends on God who shapes the world out and then looks upon it and declares it good. So that's a judicial or a royal prerogative. Um, the traditional view of the church, and I think this is something you see in the Bible as well, um, is that Adam was created as a spiritual child, and he was meant to submit to God, receive his life from God, acknowledge that everything he receives comes from above, and then in doing that, he would develop and mature and would eventually be crowned with glory and honor and be given by divine grace the capacity to reign over creation. And you see that then in the larger pattern of the book of Genesis, where Joseph does submit to God, and ultimately Joseph has the spirit of God in him. Pharaoh says, we've never seen such a wise and discerning man. And then Joseph is elevated over the land of Egypt. And then by the end of the book, he says to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, Joseph now has legitimate knowledge of good and evil. So the question is, are you going to assert your relationship to the world on your own terms, or are you going to predicate your relationship to the world and your relationship to God on subjection to God and reception of life from him? You see the same thing going on in the dichotomy between the Tower of Babel or Babylon and uh, Jacob's ladder. So uh, the word Babel in the eye or in the minds of those who were constructing the tower and city of Babel means gate of God. Uh, and then in Genesis chapter 27, Jacob has a vision of a ladder to heaven. And he says, truly, this is the gate uh, uh, gate of heaven. And he sees that ladder with its top in, in the heavens, which is a textual allusion back to Genesis chapter 11. And so you have a number of connections uh, between these two texts. And the connections between these two texts underscore the fundamental point of contrast here. In the one hand, you have the fundamental paradigm of all idolatry, which is that mankind on its own terms is creating its own name. Let us make a great name for ourselves. Let us build a tower with its top in the heavens. In other words, you start on earth and then you work your way up to heaven and you enter into God's heavenly court that way and you assert your sovereignty over the world on your own terms. And on the other hand, we have God who builds a ladder down to earth from heaven. And I think the best understanding of, uh, of the way the text reads is that God is standing at the bottom of the ladder, beside the ladder, revealing himself to Jacob. In other words, are we building up? Well, you can't ultimately do that. When you try to create a name for yourself and you name it gate of God, God says, that's not your real name. The real meaning of this is confusion. There's a parody of the very attempt to establish one's own name. And then in uh, Genesis 27, we have the beginning of the series of events where God gives Jacob a new name, which is Israel. And then ultimately, this comes into the New Testament as the contrast between uh, working according to the flesh and working according to the spirit. Uh, to work according to the flesh is attempt is an attempt to utilize one's own natural powers and abilities and operations in order to reach God in some kind of embrace versus working according to the spirit, which recognizes that all the work that we do comes ultimately and only from God who is always working in us so that um, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, not I, but the grace of God, which is with me. And this fundamental contrast is about the nature of idolatry and the reason that idolatry always leads to death. And the reason that I spend so much time going into this is because idolatry is precisely what we're dealing with. And understanding that idolatry is constituted by that network of concepts and actions helps us to understand why making an image of God in the Old Testament would necessarily constitute an act of idolatry. God had not revealed himself in visible form. So what paradigm does one have to worship God according to a visible form? One has no paradigm for that at all. The only way in which one could use a visible form to represent God would be to project that form out from one's own mind. In other words, what one would be worshiping is not God, but what Deuteronomy calls no gods. And when you worship no gods, you become no one. You disintegrate. You are worshiping no thing at all.
But in the New Testament, and this is anticipated in a number of passages in the Old Testament, we have a very strong series of suggestions that this fundamental pattern and logic has been transfigured on account of the incarnation. So I'm going to begin by just uh, summarizing this in the language of Job 42. Um, I have a video on the theology of Job, which actually explores the theology of Job uh, in a way which is going to undergird some of the premises that I'm going to rely upon in drawing this analogy. Um, Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. There is a narrative arc which runs throughout the book of Job, where at the beginning of the story, Job is excluded from God's heavenly court. And if you know the theology of the biblical temple, then you know that the heavenly court or the heavenly uh, council is located within the inner sanctuary. So the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, that corresponds to the heaven of heavens. The heaven of heavens is where God's heavenly council uh, dwells. Um and at the beginning of the book, Job is completely excluded from the proceedings of the council. He has no idea what's going on there. All he sees is what uh, happens as a result of the proceedings of the heavenly council. That is, his kingdom is taken away from him. His family is left desolate. All of that horrible stuff. At the end of the book, however, things have fundamentally changed. God has made himself known to Job in the whirlwind and has challenged Job to give answers to all sorts of questions. And in this engagement with God, uh, both in the experience that he's had throughout the book, in arguing with his three friends or what I think are royal counselors, and then in this climactic engagement with God at the end of the book, Job is perfected. Job grows up. Job is glorified. So by the end of the book, Job has actually been constituted as a member of that heavenly council. He has encountered God directly, and he makes intercession for his three friends leading to their pardon. We find that uh, this is the job of a prophet. Genesis chapter 20 says, Abraham is a prophet. He will pray for, me, pray for you and you will be healed. And uh, the Lord does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. Job has been included in that counsel from which he was earlier excluded. Job also receives a doubled kingdom. He hasn't just been restored to his position at the beginning of the book. He's been exalted. He's been elevated by virtue of this encounter with God. Moreover, we are told that the latter end of Job uh, was greater than his beginning. And this language is really interesting because this uh, dichotomy between the former days and the latter days is something which is rooted in the messianic poetry of the Pentateuch, where messianic prophecies in Genesis 49 and Numbers 24 are both couched in the language of what is going to come in the latter days or in the days of the end. And that word stands in a similar relationship to the uh, first word of the Pentateuch in the beginning that the word end has to beginning in the English language. So you have the first creation in the beginning, and then you have the new creation, which comes in the messianic age. These connections that exist in the book of Job suggest that one of the things that Job is telling us, I think this is an historical story, but as all historical stories in scripture simultaneously have allegorical meanings because history really is intrinsically typological and allegorical. One of the ways we're to read the story of Job is as a paradigm for the redemption of Israel and its transfiguration in the messianic age. And there's a lot of good scholarship that's come out in the past few decades actually showing that Isaiah's prophecies of the suffering servant, who Christians understand to be the Messiah, actually draw intertextually on a lot of the language about uh, the figure of Job. So we have this really interesting passage, which I quote to you and I explain to you here because it's a really punchy way of just summarizing this whole dynamic. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. There is something about Job's transfiguration into glory, which signifies an increased intimacy with God, which is captured by the language of now seeing God and not merely hearing God. The hearing leads you to see. Numbers 12 verse 8 is also a very, very important passage. And this is when God is, uh, he's actually contrasting the way in which he usually engages with his prophets, uh, with the unique way that he engages with Moses. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Okay, so a really interesting uh, dynamic here. With him I speak, God is engaging with Moses through the word, mouth to mouth, 
This direct connection which exists between Moses and God allows him to behold the form of the Lord. So this alone should raise questions about an interpretation of Deuteronomy 4, which reads the text as you saw no form because, you know, God fundamentally has no form. Um, and instead, it should lead us to read Deuteronomy 4 in light of the passages which indicate that God is self-concealing himself from Israel. So God is behind a veil. He's concealed in deep darkness, so on and so forth. Moses beholds the form of the Lord. And in fact, when you look at Deuteronomy 34 and its explanation of the prophet who is to come, who is like Moses, uh, one of the things which distinguishes Moses as the paradigm for the messianic prophet is the uniquely intimate connection that he has with God in this way. And then in Deuteronomy 30, which explains the redemption of Israel in their restoration from exile, which is always a messianic signpost. The messianic age happens at the regathering of Israel from her exile, which is signified as resurrection in Ezekiel chapter 37. Well, the language that is used for the way in which Israel relates to God under that new covenant is that the word of God is now in their mouth. They now have that uniquely intimate relationship with God that was restricted only to Moses at this period in covenant history. Now, what's interesting then when you work into the New Testament is you find this dynamic of an increased intimacy with God that is expressed in the contrast of hearing and seeing in a number of texts which actually refer back to um, uh, this language from the old covenant. So John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John 16, 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. So when John's prologue, which sets the thematic undercurrent of his entire gospel and indeed uh, his apocalypse, the prologue says, the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has expressed or revealed or executed or made known the person of the father. And the interesting thing about the way that John's gospel in particular develops this theme is the way that it connects this to the second word. So John's gospel takes this um, bifurcation which I've suggested to you exists in the Old Testament. Um, and he develops it according to the language of hearing and sight. And moreover, he then connects that language to the specific form or verbal framing of the second commandment. So John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt, literally tabernacled among us, and we have seen his glory, Glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, one thing that's very interesting about this text is that this actually is an allusion to God's self-disclosure to Moses in Exodus 33 to 34. When God reveals his name to Moses after Moses ascends Mount Sinai to make intercession for Israel after their sin with the golden calf, when God reveals him, his name to Moses, he reveals his name um, as the Lord, the Lord, a God uh, gracious and compassionate, who is full of steadfast love. And if you look at the uh, way that this is rendered in the Septuagint, and you compare that to the language of John 1.14, actually you see that Exodus 30, or that John 1 is alluding to Exodus 34. And again, it is bringing the entire body of the church into the reality which Moses had uniquely experienced on Mount Sinai under the Old Covenant. So remember, Moses beholds the form of the Lord. Lord. What happens when he comes down that mountain? His face is radiant with divine glory. And what happens then? Israel can't withstand it and his face needs to be veiled. Well, that experience, which Moses uniquely has in the old covenant, seems to be applied to the church writ large under the new covenant. And this is part of John's larger theme whereby he contrasts the old covenant under Moses and the new covenant through the Messiah. For the Torah was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. And in fact, that is the, uh, the language that we see in the Septuagint of Exodus chapter 34 about the revelation of the name of the Lord. No one has ever seen God, 
Uh, God, this this translation says uh, the only God. Well, I think that uh, it is actually God, the only begotten or the only begotten. A uh, God, the only begotten who is in the bosom or at the side of the father. He has made him known or revealed him or expressed him. So we have the old covenant which was through Moses, and it put Israel at a certain distance from God. God interacted with them through a series of veils, and Moses uniquely had direct access to God with whom he engaged mouth to mouth and beheld the form of the Lord. And then you have the new covenant where that experience, which belonged to Moses under the old covenant, is applied to all Christians in the new. And then there is a broader second word theme in John's gospel. What Jesus says in John 5, 37 to his opponents is, Absolutely fascinating. And the father who has sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. Now, if you remember uh, what we just quoted from Deuteronomy chapter four earlier in this presentation, you should recognize the intertextual connection that exists between that text and this text. What Jesus is doing here is he's asserting that his opponents uh, are in discontinuity uh, not only with the messianic blessing that Jesus brings, but also with the faithful expression of God's revelation under the old covenant. They have neither seen his form nor heard his voice, whereas Israel at Mount Sinai, they heard a voice but did not see a form. One of the things that this does, if you just follow the language of form throughout the Gospel of John, is it establishes the connection of all of that visible language, of all that form language, of all that seeing language, specifically with the second commandment. Uh, John the Evangelist has the second commandment in mind when he is writing uh, about Jesus and quoting Jesus in these terms. Also in John chapter 4, there is a connection to the second commandment, though it's a little less direct. In John chapter 4, Jesus is engaging with a Samaritan woman, and the question is, on what mountain are the people of God to worship? So the Samaritans believed God's holy mountain was Mount Gerizim. Uh, the Jews believed that it was Mount Moriah, the mount of the temple. And Jesus says... Basically, well, the Jews are right. Salvation is from the Jews. You worship whom you do not know, but the hour is coming. And note again that language of the hour which is coming. The hour is coming where neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship, but everywhere men will worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, the reason that I raise that is because if you just look at the structure of the book of Deuteronomy, the way the book of Deuteronomy works is you have Moses who presents Israel with the 10 words again. That's where that quotation from Deuteronomy 4 comes from. And then when you work through the rest of Deuteronomy, you find that thematically Moses expires it's point by point the details and the implications which follow out each of the Ten Commandments. So one example of that is the Fifth Commandment, which commands uh, uh, us to honor your father and mother. Well, it's in that section of the book of Deuteronomy where you get all of these commandments to honor all authority figures, the prophets, the kings, the priests. All of those are couched in terms of the honor that is owed to father and mother. And just note that later in the Bible, that connection is developed when uh, uh, Elisha, for example, says about Elijah, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. The prophets are, in a sense, the father or parent uh, of Israel. And in Deuteronomy chapter 12, you have the commandment to worship God sacrificially only at the central sanctuary, at the place in which God chooses to set his name. Now, the emphasis in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Uh, 12 is the divine prerogative to choose the mode in which he discloses himself. That is why Moses presents the commandment to worship God at a central sanctuary in connection with the commandment not to worship God through graven images because God did not reveal himself in visible form. God chose to set his name at a particular place. It is God's condescension which forms the basis for our ascension. God built a ladder down, and then we can climb that ladder up only because God built it down. And that's actually what you see in the book of Genesis. When Jacob beholds the ladder to heaven for the first time, he goes through a series of experiences uh, of persecution under Laban and a number of other things, which eventually leads him back to the promised land. And when he comes back to the promised land, he wrestles with God. And then he beholds God at the end of that night in which he has wrestled God. And he has another vision of the ladder to heaven. The idea being that Jacob, through prayer and tears and suffering, has ascended that ladder by which God descended. 
and in the Gospel of John, you have that ladder to heaven theme appearing in the very first chapter. Uh, in the first chapter of John's Gospel, uh, Jesus says to Nathaniel, you will see greater things than this. You will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, that language about angels ascending and descending is a specific verbal echo of the description of the ladder to heaven in the book of Genesis. In other words, Jesus is the ladder to heaven because Jesus is the uh, person in whom God has permanently bound himself up with the stuff of our world. And because of that, we can ascend through his descent. Uh, and so John 4 and the emphasis on the uh, change that occurs on account of the incarnation, the emphasis on the reality of not only having to worship at the temple anymore, but you can worship anywhere because God has now built a ladder down to heaven that extends out to the ends of the earth. That also connects to the second word and also underscores the reality that the second word and everything that is included within that framework is transfigured on account of the incarnation. Now, I want to add to this that uh, in the book of Kings, you have the architecture of the Temple of Solomon presented to us in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 7. Uh, and the architecture of the Temple of Solomon obviously uh, resembles very closely the architecture of the tabernacle, but different words are used in a number of cases and they're changed in a number of ways. Um, one of the things that changes is that uh, what was formerly called the Holy of Holies is called the uh, inner sanctuary. And the really interesting thing about the uh, word that's used for inner sanctuary, which is the beer, um, is that it seems to come from the word meaning to speak or word, the bar. Uh, and so when John in John chapter one says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us using a very specific word, which as far as I can recall, is only elsewhere used in uh, Revelation chapter 14, where it says God will tabernacle over his people. Um the fact that John says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us is very interesting because it seems to connect with the connection between word or speaking and the inner sanctuary in the book of Kings. So the inner sanctuary or the pattern uh, which exists in God, which forms the blueprint for all creation, joins itself to that creation, uh, which is formed from that blueprint. And note, uh, I don't want to lean too heavily on the imagery in Israel's liturgical system, but I think it's an interesting point to note that where there is imagery or iconography in Israel's liturgical system, it is focused very specifically in the sanctuary and in the heavenly court. So you have the two cherubim, which are placed beside the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And then you also have images of cherubim, which are in the uh, middle part of the nave of the temple in the days of King Solomon. So the Holy of Holies or the inner sanctuary tabernacles among us. God has built a ladder down to heaven and that ladder extends to the entirety of creation so that you can worship God liturgically and access his presence directly wherever you worship him in spirit and truth. That is at least to me suggestive of the possibility of iconography on a more universal scale. Iconography is placed in these specific places in creation. It is placed in the Holy of Holies because that is where God has connected the heaven of heavens with this material cosmos. And because that is the point of his connection with this material cosmos, it is there appropriate to create visible signs of the reality which exists in God's heavenly council or heavenly court. So when you go into the heavenly courtroom, which is in uh, liturgically speaking, the Holy of Holies. What you see is you see what Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 7, or you see what Isaiah sees in Isaiah chapter 6. You see myriads of angels that are serving the enthroned God of Israel. And that is why angels are then depicted at this specific place in Israel's liturgical system. This contrast between hearing and seeing and the association of the capacity to see God in his glory under the new covenant is also explained uh, exposited in a very direct way by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 3 and 4. So let me just read to you verses 13 to 18 of chapter 3. Uh, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For this 
to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Remember, the veil is what separates the presence of God from the people of Israel, and it is in the incarnate word that we are able to engage directly with the presence of God, which is connected in Numbers 12 and elsewhere with the capacity not only to hear the voice, but to see the face of God. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. The language of heart here is very interesting because remember what I said earlier about the connection between Deuteronomy chapter 30 and the unique capacities of Moses as the greatest prophet of the old covenant. Moses speaks to God mouth to mouth and beholds the form of the Lord. Well, at the redemption of Israel from her exile in the Messianic age, according to Deuteronomy 30, the word of God will be in your mouth and in your heart. And because it is in their mouth, all the people of Israel now share in what was restricted to Moses in the old covenant. So a veil lies over their heart. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. This is a reference back to the Old Testament where Moses would turn away from Israel and towards God and would remove the veil from his face and engage with God directly. Now, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And then Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, to say that we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that is most fascinating has been that has been explored by um, um I think it's Scott Hafman in his book on 2 Corinthians 4, uh, is that Paul in this passage, is working with a network of allusions back to Exodus 33 to 34, that pivotal covenant renewal passage where Moses beholds God and has to put a veil over his face as a consequence. And remember that this is the very text which John alludes to in reference to the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So there is a consistent pattern of exegesis that pervades the New Testament, but especially 2 Corinthians and the Gospel of John, that suggests that the Old Covenant uh, is associated with hearing the voice, but not seeing, and the New Covenant, on account of the Incarnation, is one in which we not only hear, but we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, so that we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father. So if this is all true, if it is the case that the basis for the Old Covenant prohibition on making and honoring images is rooted in the fact that God did not disclose himself to the people of Israel in visible form, and if it is the case that unlike the Old Covenant, in the New Covenant, God has now disclosed himself to his people, the church, in the visible revelation of Jesus Christ, and if it is the case that we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which I mentioned because some people have said, well, the apostles beheld the glory of God. Uh, they had seen his glory. We haven't seen Christ. Therefore, this can't form any kind of basis for legitimacy of iconography. But in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul takes that very language and he applies it to the entire church. This is a corporate reality in which we all share the incarnation as the visible disclosure of the God of Israel is something which belongs to the entire church because Christ has wrought an ontological change in the creation and human nature and in the relationship between God and creation through mankind. So if that's the case, and if that was the basis of the Old Covenant prohibition on making icons. The implication would be, if we are to worship God after the pattern of his self-disclosure, then our worship of God must include a recognition of the visible aspect of God's self-disclosure. So we are not to build a tower up to heaven. Rather, we are to ascend that ladder which God has built down from heaven. That ladder which God has built down from heaven, according to the Gospel of John, is the incarnate Logos himself. He is the one through whom we ascend into God's presence. He is the one in whom we see the glory and face of God. 
And if that is an essential internal aspect of the way in which God relates to the creation in which he has disclosed himself, then we have to recognize that and replicate that symbolically by making visible imprints of the face of Christ in whom God has disclosed himself. So what is the logic then of venerating an icon? So many Protestants, including Dr. Ortland, have made the argument that, well, it is at least arguable that we can make what they would call religious art. We can make religious art. We can make images of Christ. And some of them will even say that, well, in the old covenant, you couldn't make an image of God, but now we can make an image, but we can't honor or venerate that image. I'm not saying that's Dr. Ortland's position, but I've heard that position articulated before. But what's the logic of venerating an icon? Well, the first thing to say is that the biblical prohibition on images in the second commandment uh, does not contain a category for a religious image which can be made but not honored. And when I say venerate, I mean honor. So when we talk about the veneration of icons, this is a ritual way in which we express our devotion and honor to God. And I think that we live in a very informal context. I think that understanding the ritual way in which this honor is paid to God through iconography is more intelligible when you look, for example, at the very uh, strict uh, systems of etiquette that uh, belong to a royal court, for example, or in the Orient to uh, various kinds of family members. There is a very specific pattern of etiquette which you owe in virtue of your obligations and relations to your various family members or to the emperor or to things like that. So veneration, honor, devotion, I see these all as basically representing the same concept. Uh, when the Bible forbids the use of imagery, it says you shall not make you shall not worship. And note that it says you shall not make before it says you shall not worship or bow down. And that is because the reason that you're not supposed to bow down to these images is because you can't make them to begin with. If you make an image of God, in other words, under the Old Testament, you haven't actually made an image of God. You can't make an image of God because in order to make an image, you need to first see that which you're depicting. But because God had not made himself visible, he had not disclosed his form to the people of Israel, they cannot even in principle make a genuine image or symbol or representation of God that has any authentic connection between the sign and that which is signified. So scripture has no category for an image that can be made but not honor. So if you follow everything that I've said to this point about the not only the permissibility, but the importance of depicting God in Jesus Christ in visible form, because that is the way in which God has disclosed himself under the new covenant, the implication of that, if you accept the fundamental connection between making and honoring, is that we are to honor that image which we make precisely because it is a genuine and not a false image. So this is the basic point that uh, the honor that we give to the sign passes to that which is signified. And scripture prohibits giving honor to images because the sign has no connection with what it is supposed to signify. Well, if you want to see the biblical basis for this logic, um, you think one place you can look is in Ephesians um, uh, chapters 1 and 6. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 refers to the spirit of the Son, who is given to the people of God in Christ to lead them to their inheritance, which is the uh, renewed creation, which has been recapitulated and stitched together and glorified in the person of Christ. And the Spirit is called here the Spirit of promise, because the promise in Ephesians chapter 1 is that inheritance. It is that Abrahamic inheritance, which belongs to the entirety of the people of God, which is the renewed creation. And it's interesting, if you compare the beginning and the end of the letter to the Ephesians, this language of promise recurs again at the end of the letter. And Paul refers to the first commandment with a promise, and that is the commandment to honor your father and your mother. And he says, this is the first commandment with a promise. Well, what exactly is the promise? The promise is that you might live long in the land of your inheritance. Well, that connects very straightforwardly with the theme that Ephesians begins with. 
The inheritance is the renewed creation. That is what is given in Christ, the people of God who've been adopted into the commonwealth of Israel as descendants of Abraham. Uh, and the fact that Paul connects the commandment to honor our earthly fathers and mothers with the commandment to, um, uh, or with the importance of, uh, of honoring God, the Father, who as the Father gives us the spirit of promise and adopts us into sonship through the only begotten Son, underscores the basic biblical reality of this point, that the honor which goes to the sign passes to the one which is signified. But in a way, you know, I really wonder, and you, you could we could spend a lot of time just arguing this premise. I've heard some people try to contend that this is somehow a, you know, a, a pagan or just a, a Hellenistic or Roman idea that the honor which goes to uh, the sign passes to the one signified. But this is really something which everyone accepts as a matter of course. Um, if something is genuinely a sign, that if it, it really signifies the one who it's supposed to signify, well, the honor which you give to it is going to reflect your disposition or attitude to the one whom it signifies. So, you know, just take an image of Christ and go to, you know, any apparent iconoclast and spit on the image of Christ. Well, they will all know what that means. And I would argue, I would suggest, I very strongly suspect that uh, they will be very deeply um, offended and think that it's detestable to spit on an image of Christ. Now, why is that the case? Why is that just our instinctive gut reaction? Well, it's because we all recognize that if you have a sign, that implies a connection between the sign and the one signified. And if the dishonor which, pass, uh, which you give to the sign passes to the one who is signified, well, then the honor which is given to the sign passes to the one who is signified. And so the essential foundation of this argument, and I think in biblical terms, the entire argument for the laicity of iconography and veneration turns on this question of whether visible icons can constitute genuine or legitimate symbols of God. Because the whole basis for the Old Testament prohibition on iconography is, in fact, that any visible representation of God will not be a representation at all. But those very statements, those very prohibitions, the language that they use to prohibit that practice is taken up by the New Testament and used in such a way as to show that now, because God has made himself visible in the face of Jesus Christ, through whom we behold his glory, that logic is stood on its head. If we worship God after the mode of his self-disclosure, well, if the mode of his self-disclosure is visible, then we must worship God in a way that recognizes and expresses the reality of that visible manifestation. So that is, in a nutshell, uh, the biblical argument, I think, for the laicity of the veneration and the making of icons. And I think, as I pointed out, you can't separate the issue of making and venerating in biblical terms. So I want to kind of turn this over to uh, Michael now. And because many people are going to then wonder, okay, well, that's, that's great. It's kind of, it's that, that sounds kind of, uh, you know, abstract and conceptual. If this is actually the reality of what the New Testament does, well, that should shape out the witness of the church from its earliest centuries. And so I'm going to turn it over to Michael now, and we can explore some of the ways in which we see this reality shaping out the actual life of the church in those early centuries.